everybody. Welcome to Strategy in Future. My name is Jacek Bartoszak, and today is a very special guest, uh, Admiral Big McRaven, uh, a, a legendary figure in the history of warfare, I might say so. Of course, my guest uh, violently uh, prohibited me from saying this, but basically this is what I think, and I'm entitled to say what I want. So I'm, do I'm uh, exploiting, take advantage of this uh, privilege, and you can really check in books and, uh, and in internet uh, the merits of my guest today. Uh, hello, sir. It's good to be with you. Let me start with the, um, with the, uh, the, 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 it seems a basic question, but quite an important one um, in current times. What do you think, based on your personal experience on the ground, and also what you observe now in Ukraine and elsewhere, what is the direction of the evolution of the battlefield? What is the center of gravity of the battlefield? What is the balance between the morale of a soldier who is equipped more and more with sophisticated weaponry, between the, uh, the information dominance that the soldier may or may not be equipped, OODA loop that connects all this, and of course the hardware, you know, the uh, fires, uh, everything that is used to be, you know, old school of thinking about the military warfare. If you just, we could start uh, from, from, from this, uh, I would appreciate it. Well, if you look at the bookshelves behind me, this is my library in my home in Austin, Texas. Uh, it is filled with books on military strategy and battles. And, and what I'd offer is that I'm not sure warfare has fundamentally changed since Clausewitz uh, wrote the book on war. And of course, you can go back to Sun Tzu, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, when you take a look at the fundamentals that Clausewitz laid out in terms of mass and maneuver, the strength of the defense over the offense, uh, the ne necessity for morale, uh, all of these things, I think, still apply in modern warfare. Yes, the instruments of war have changed. You know, we've gone from the bow and arrow to the high mars. Um, but I think what you find in warfare today, particularly as we see it unfolding in Ukraine, is that morale is important. Obviously, the Ukrainians are fighting for their homeland. They're fighting for freedom. They're fighting to keep from being oppressed by the Russians. Uh, you also see on the battlefield that the defense is strong. So Clausewitz once said that the defense is stronger than the offense. Because the defense only has to preserve and protect, while the offense has to impose its will upon the enemy. So when you think about those two ends of the spectrum, the defense and the offense, the Russians came in, of course, early on, thinking that it was going to be an easy march to Kiev, an easy march through Kharkiv, an easy march up from the Crimea. And none of that proved to be true because... The Ukrainian defenses and the Ukrainian morale was very strong. Now what you're seeing, of course, is it's applying to some degree to the Ukrainian counteroffensive. They are now trying to move on to Russian-held terrain in the Donbass region, going from Zaporizhia to Maripol. And, of course, the Russians have set up very strong minefields and tank traps, etc. They're going to have a tough time pushing through. Even with all of the sophisticated technology, even with high Mars and with the leopard tanks and with the nature of warfare. Yes, on the margins, it's different because of the nature of the weapon systems, but the fundamentals, I don't think have changed much. Now, you know, when I look at the wars that I spent most of my time in over the past uh, 20 some odd years, uh, they were much different. They were insurgencies. They were a superior, um, force in terms of weaponry going against a, a much less superior force. But on the battlefield, it was still mano a mano. It was oftentimes they were in knife fights and close-in gun fights that are the same that you would have found back in the Roman days without the guns. So the basic, you know, necessity to fight and the basic uh, apparatus of warfare hasn't changed. What I've seen, though, is that when you look at Ukraine, once again, these are almost World War I tactics. Uh, it is warfare by attrition. It is warfare by barrages. It is warfare by siege. But these are the same sort of things that we've seen over and over again. 
the question will become information dominance. You mentioned information dominance. And we've always known, and this is true today, and it was true thousands of years ago, that the force that can make a decision faster with better information is generally, if, if all things being equal, is generally going to win, right? Sure. So the opportunity for the Ukrainians in this case, or pick a, a more recent fight, anytime you have information dominance, and you have the speed at which the decisions are made, and you have a comparable force, you're probably going to win. If you have information dominance and speed, but the enemy is 10 times stronger than you are, back to Clausewitz, the defense is stronger than the offense, you're still going to have a tough time winning that battle. Um, I think what you find is on the battlefield, the Ukrainians and the Russians, actually not in numbers, but comparable in terms of military hardware. And therefore, now if the Ukrainians can speed up the information cycle, speed up the decision cycle, they're going to have some advantage in engaging with the Russians. Yeah, but you mentioned strength. But what is the definition of strength? What are the well, elements of strength yeah. in the battle? Yeah, so of course you can look at strength purely in numbers of mass, and that was Clausewitz's point, of course, was that you know, mass and maneuver are really what are important on the battlefield. And I still think, in spite of, uh, you know, I'm a special operations guy, and of course when you look at great special operations, it was always a smaller force going against a larger, more defended force. The whole point of the theory of special operations that I broached in, in my uh, military thesis was that why does that happen? How can a smaller force defeat a larger force that goes against everything that Clausewitz said? Well, the reason a smaller force can defeat a, a larger force is surprise, speed, violence of action, information, intelligence better trained, better equipped, all those sorts of things. But you can only do it for a small period of time. So I make the point in my thesis that if the special operations force is competing against a larger, stronger force, they're going to have to get in very quickly, do the job, and get out because they will not be able to sustain that level of superiority for a long time. But when we look at strength on the battlefield, it is still about mass. It is still about weapon systems. And it is still about the morale. Uh, and so when we think about strength, one of the great factors that the Ukrainians have going for them today, of course, is they have this great strength of heart, great morale among the force. And I think it was Napoleon said, you know, morale is to uh, the enemy as four is to one or something along those lines. The fact of the matter is morale matters. That is a strength of your military force. Um, so, again, while the hardware changes, I'm not sure the fundamental aspects change greatly. You know, since we are talking about strength, so what is the, uh, you know, if you command the troops in the field and you see the enemy and its strength, so what is the method of breaching? What is the method of defeating the enemy? Is it defeating the thought? Is it Seeking the asymmetries that are might might be multiple, multiple. Right. For example, you have a big army, then you have a heavy logistics, heavy food supply. So you can, uh, you know, you can do some uh, insert. I mean, some sort of a war against the communication lines. If you have heavy mass, then there is oil, fuel, right. and that's a vulnerability. So everything that is a superiority might be a weakness if we make it asymmetrical in a way. So how do you approach stra strategy on the battlefield against a concrete enemy who you know? You, you, do you seek asymmetries or try to equalize the numbers? What's the, uh, what's the, uh, the approach that you might find fit? Well, I think you have to do all of them. So the fact of the matter is you're always looking for asymmetric advantages, right? So take, take a look at World War II. Uh, you know, you've got the Maginot lines. You have the... Uh, Albert Canal defenses up in Belgium, and uh, and the French uh, thought that the Maginot Line would stop the the Blitzkrieg, and of course they basically just went around it, uh, or they they broke through it at some point in time on the Maginot Line. Um, whenever you look at, for example, shaping operations, you know shaping operations are not intended to go mass on mass. Your shaping operations, to your point, 
You're going to look for the communication hub so that you can take it down. You're going to look at the, the resupply depot so that you can stop the logistics flow into the front lines. You're looking for these asymmetric, these weak points in the enemy's defenses that a special operations force or maybe a high Mars or maybe a small infantry unit can get into and disrupt that's going to affect the confrontation of the masses, right? All of those are important. I do not think that all of those are decisive. Um, sooner or later, the enemy has to meet on the battlefield uh, in, a, in a way, at least in the case of Ukraine and Russia. That may, that's different, I think, in an insurgency. That was different in the American war in, in, in Vietnam. Um, but in this case, I do think sooner or later, you're going to have to meet on the battlefield head to head. That doesn't mean, of course, that the Ukrainians shouldn't. And in fact, they are taking advantage of these asymmetric uh, opportunities. They're going to hit you know, key bridges, key nodes, key communications where the Russians have got weak defenses. So certainly um, you want to take as much advantage of, of, of the asymmetric uh, opportunities as you can. Again, I will still dwell upon strength. Uh, and we have talked about soldiers and the morale. Yep. So given the experience in Ukraine about citizenry, about a soldier citizen defending homeland, uh, if we think about the modern battlefield, when usually soldiers should be sophisticated, the equipment is sophisticated. Uh, take an example of the United States, you, uh, all volunteer force. Yep. And there was a sort of predominant opinion that all volunteer force was a better kind of a force um, yep. in the 21st century. And so what is your assessment? Given the uh, the events in Ukraine, uh, in times of you know modern warfare, how does the uh, total conscription, total mobilization concept, uh, soldiery, citizenry, how does this concept work? Has it changed since you know the French Revolution when actually it, it emerged? What what what? First and fresh observations can we can we deduct from from what unfolds in your brain? Yeah, I, I think it's um, it's a good question, by the way, and, and I do think that there are um, issues of the nature of the conflict. So, in Ukraine, uh, when they had to mobilize the Ukrainian men between the ages of eighteen and forty-five, or whatever it was. They knew that they were being mobilized to fight for their families, to fight for their homeland, to fight for their property. And so their morale, even if they weren't professional soldiers, they come in back to the strength. This is a strength of the army. Conversely, in Russia, as Putin mobilized you know, 300,000 last year and then a couple hundred thousand this year, if they did not think that this was a just war and they are not fighting for their homeland, then their morale and the level of their strength and the level of their enthusiasm is going to be somewhat less. Again, I can go back to you know, the American war in Vietnam. Uh, we had a superior military force. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is uh, the Vietnamese felt they were fighting for their homeland. So they had a morale advantage, I think, over the Americans and probably over the French before that. If you look at the American Revolutionary War, you have the British Army comes over to the Americas, to the United States. And I think the American forces under George Washington lost almost every fight. We won a few, but not many of them, right? And yet, the, and the British had a superior force. But the British were fighting not on their homeland. They weren't fighting for their family. They weren't fighting for their, uh, for their king, per se. And the small ragtag American force under George Washington essentially defeats the British, right? So I, I think these parallels uh, are not without importance when you look at Russia and Ukraine. Russia mobilized people to fight in an unjust war. Now, maybe they don't all believe that. I'm sure many of them think that it is a justified war. But I think there are also a lot of them that think that, why am I away from my home? Why am I fighting in Bakhmut in a small town that I could care less about. You flip that and the Ukrainians are fighting in Bakhmut because a lot of them lived in Bakhmut, right? So it, it is important. Why, uh, again, why are you being mobilized? That, that's the question that also gives 
rise to the strength of the uh, of the force. Of course, that 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 makes me pose another question of, of similar importance. Uh, the Russian uh, the Russians reformed their military since it was uh, quite a stationary military in the Soviet times, huge one conscription based, and without uh, you know uh, big army standing in terms of the, your readiness and stuff. Uh, and it was so like it was like that uh, prior to the Bolshevik Revolution. So the Tsarist army also worked like that since the Crimean War, Milutin's reform, and they destroyed it on purpose to have a very uh, you know handy weapon, uh, handy instrument of foreign policy, but it turned out to be small and without heavy reserves. And you know also the United States now seems not to have. A significant reserve force if there is any war land war in eurasia and the times are upon us that you know this war is not so much uh, out of the out of question so to speak so what do you think in terms of evolution of um, our convictions uh, what we think about this whether we will be back like poland my country poland back to conscription whether we will be back to the mass reserves and potential war or attrition wars, uh, whether will there will be a, a debate also in the United States about it, also given the uh, the, the shortage of the, you know, demographic problems in the West, sort of the quality quality of uh, conscript, quality of uh, manpower. So, what do you think? What are your you know, what what are your thoughts? That well, was- I would never put myself in a position to tell the. Polish government and the Polish people how to how to build their military. Um, so in the United States, though, uh, I I believe, and I, I do not think it's necessarily correct that there is this belief that technology will supplant um, you know pure manpower, that we will overcome the need and the necessity for a large force by having a highly sophisticated force. And I think to some degree, there is merit in that philosophy. Yes, you know, a single HIMARS uh, or, a, or a hypersonic weapon or, you know, or drones overhead or a remotely piloted vehicle, they can all be 10 times better than, you know, putting a reconnaissance element, let's say, on the ground, say a a Navy SEAL element on the ground to do a reconnaissance mission against a an adversary's missile site. Well, that would take you know 14 people and et cetera, et cetera. Where well, with one uh, unmanned aerial vehicle, a drone, you get that information and probably better information, right? So technology is certainly. Um, making the necessity for certain elements and certain amounts of manpower not obsolete, but uh, less required. But we said that all along. When the machine gun was developed, people said, well, now we don't need single infantrymen carrying weapons. Well, that was great until everybody had machine guns, and then you need a lot of people carrying machine guns, right? So I do not think that technology is ever going to overcome the need for mass on the battlefield. War eventually is about holding terrain. War eventually is about making the enemy suffer so much that they are prepared to surrender. And that invariably means putting men, troops, men and women on the ground to hold terrain, to fight a lot of times one-on-one. And uh, and so this idea that somehow we can send a bunch of drones overhead or we can use cyber to change the the morale of the enemy. I don't necessarily believe all that. Uh, I believe that people are going to fight and fight hard until somebody is on their doorstep uh, breaking down that door in order to change the way they think about their safety and their security. So, um, so this gets back to your point. It's a long way of saying I still think countries need a strong ground force um, that is in a position to both defend the country, defend the borders, uh, defend it from invasion, 
and if necessary, be able to power project that large force, as in the case of the United States, maybe somewhere in the Pacific, maybe to help our allies in Europe, who knows. Um, but I still think you need a large ground force. And I think there will always be a need for a large ground force. How large? Well, that's always the debate every year. How much can you afford? What is the balance between weapon systems and manpower? Um, but this idea that somehow in the future, it will all be about you know drones fighting drones and remote warfare, I don't think that will um, put anybody in a position to win a, a contentious war. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this uh, idea that um, in the era of precision that is upon us, I mean, at least in the nascent phase of it, that the precision is killing the mass if there is an information dominance? Because if you have, you know, two companies of tanks that are massing to attack some position, if they are spotted in advance and there, there are fires uh, used against them, they are completely, they are completely vulnerable. As opposed to the Second World War, for example, you know, where this depth of reconnaissance was, and you know, sophistication was not that was not that obvious. So, what do you think about uh, you know the smaller force equipped with precision, uh, more of precision weapons, and of course equipped with uh, superiority informa information dominance? Uh, what do you think about this idea? Can it offset the mass? Can it offset the uh, uh, and is it possible that a medium country or a small country can defeat a large country, even not in the, uh, you know, guerrilla warfare, but also in the open field conflict because of precision and information and speed of information process? So, uh, and then if, a... I may say, if I may add, sir, this is a critically important question yeah. for Poland. We are sure. smaller in population. We are feeling the force now. We are ready to to field a large land force in Europe to face. But, you know, we need to seek asymmetries to really win in the open field. We don't want to have a guerrilla warfare against Russia. We want to be yeah. ready to take on them. So this is a critically important, uh, you know, debate uh, here in these quarters. Well, I, I think it's an important debate everywhere. Um, the My concern is that the reality might be different than the expectation. So it is, and again, the nature of special operations is just what you have outlined, right? You have talked about a special operations force. You're talking about technical superiority. When we own the special operations forces, we are going to be technically superior to, to our enemy. We're going to have drones overhead. We're going to have night vision goggles. We're going to have superior weapon systems. The forces are better trained. Each individual soldier is better trained than the individual soldiers they're going to be going up to. We're going to find the asymmetric opportunity. We're going to engage it, and then we're going to hit that target. All of that is good. So if you're thinking that creating a, a essentially a large Polish army that is like a special operations force, because you have information dominance, you have you know technological superiority, uh, you have better trained soldiers, so you don't need as many of them. I would offer that. That is an approach, but I don't know that it's the approach that will defeat a large you know, force like Russia, if you're, if you're thinking along those lines. The one thing I was always careful about telling my superiors was the special operations force, to include the Army Rangers, who were kind of light infantry, very elite light infantry, were very, very good at what we do. But we were never in a position to stop the Soviet Union from coming through the Folda Gap. We're not in a position to stop the North Koreans from coming south into South Korea. We can't keep the Straits of Malacca or the Straits of Hormuz open. Right? My point is light, highly trained, technically strong forces that have information dominance and uh, decision speed. That's all good. You need that. Don't misunderstand me. But when you're talking about a concerted war, warfare the way we're seeing right now in Ukraine, I don't think that alone will be sufficient enough to win a war. You can damage the enemy. 
And if the enemy is weak and the morale is not there, maybe. But at the end of the day, you still need, in pure Clausewitzian form, you still need mass and maneuver in order to dominate the enemy, right? Because eventually, you know, mass wins out. It just, it does. <laughs> you know, no, that's not what you want to hear. I know what you want to hear is you want to hear that if Poland builds a small elite force that has information superiority and technical dominance, they'll be able to take on a much larger force. They will certainly be able to defend themselves well. And I'm not telling you not to do that. But if you think that will defeat a larger force over time, over time, I think you're mistaken. Yeah, that's that's a good question because, you know, if, if, if I may dive a little bit into details, and that might be interesting for you, and I wonder what, what your reaction would be. You know, we are at the crossroads now in Poland. First of all, our geography is putting a question mark. What sort of force we should field? Defensive force using the rivers inside Poland, but yep. then we have attrition warfare on our territory, you know, fires, long-range fires, so we are vulnerable exposed to, to destruction. Or we can use the buffer zones in the east, build Russia and Ukraine, in case there is a war, to impose our fires in a strategic active defense. Yeah, But yeah. that puts, of course, political dilemma on NATO and stuff. And also, that's a different kind of force. Different kind of force in terms of the uh, what we feel and what we finance. And also, it's about projecting power potentially in the East if we want to support Ukrainians, for example, in another phase of war. Because if we have some truce now, and in four years' time, there will be a you know repetition of that, which is quite probable, then the new balance of power, including Poland and, and uh, Ukraine, may be fighting together against Russians. And we, can, we might be projecting power there. And I don't know. We need to make decisions in that respect. Plus, we have this coalition warfare because we are NATO. So whether we are a subsidiary force of the United States, but the United States doesn't want to have a heavy boots and fall on the ground in Eurasia, so it's only about enablers from long distance, you know, long French fires and reconnaissance, So, and we are the land force. So many questions, sir, that we have. And we need to you know, spend money, and yeah. we need to organize force. So, um, Well, let, let me offer a little bit more thoughts on this, because... Mm -hmm. It is, again, I'll go back to Clausewitz. Um, Clausewitz has a saying that everything in war is simple. It's just the simple things are difficult. Everything in war is simple. It's just the simple things are difficult. And, and I think by that, when you think about how you build a, an armed forces, and you've laid out, again, and I'm, not, I'm never going to be in a position, I'm never going to attempt to tell another country how best to build their military. But you've laid out some, some great approaches to this. Yes, you're going to want to use the rivers for defense. Uh, yes, you're in certain parts of the country, you may need to have a heavier presence than in other parts. At the end of the day, though, I think war um, is really about the morale and the professionalism of the soldiers. It is about the speed of decision. Because on the battlefield, no matter where the battlefield is, if it's a long forward edge of the battlefield, the force that can maneuver, well, see the enemy, make a decision, maneuver to where they have an advantage, that's always going to be of value to the attacking force, right? So you always want to make sure that you have a level of information dominance and a level of uh, decision making. This is one of the reasons the Russians have had a lot of problems. They're still using a Soviet model when it comes to their operations. Now, they've learned a little bit over the last year and a half, but not much. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, you know, the Ukrainians started getting trained by the West in about 2014. And the first thing, of course, the West had to do was to break them of their Soviet-style mentality. And it really was about, look, you're going to have to be uh, decentralized. You want to be able to empower the young army captains and the sergeant majors and others to make decisions back to the speed of decision making. You don't want to have to have the captains got to talk to the majors, got to talk to the lieutenant colonels, got to talk to the colonels, got to talk to the general. If you if you have to have that sort of hierarchical approach, you're never going to be able to outmaneuver the enemy in a timely fashion, right? So that was one of the things I know that the West worked with the Ukrainians on was 
that you got to, I know you, a lot of you were former Soviet officers. You've got to break this mindset. That was hard. You have to build a non-commissioned officer corps so that once again, you're in a position for the senior enlisted to be making decisions at the tactical level uh, so that all those decisions don't have to go up through a chain of command. Um, but you have to have build the right non-commissioned officer corps. So a lot of these things are, it, it is more than just about, again, information dominance and speed. It is about the soldier themselves. I talk about the fact that when you look at the Russians, you know, they spent the last 15 or 20 years modernizing their army. I mean, they went from the T-72 to the T-80 to the T-90 tank. They modernized a lot of things, but they didn't modernize their soldier. They didn't modernize their tactics. You know, when we think, and you started to say this earlier about kind of combined arms approach, in Poland and the United States, when we think about an objective, we say, okay, here's an objective. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to call in fires, right? And, uh, and then we're going to bring in an airstrike. And then we're going to bring in armor. And then we're going to bring in the infantry. And oh, by the way, it's all going to be synchronized. Bang, 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 bang. Infantry comes in, right, to hold the terrain. What you saw with the Russians early on, particularly in Kiev, was, you know, a couple barrages come through. And then, okay, where's the armor? Well, the armor's stuck on the roads. And they're now in this big, long line, so they're not coming. A couple of airplanes come in, drops it. Well, you bring in a few paratroopers. Nothing was synchronized. There was no sense of combined arms tactics in terms, and you're still not seeing it. What are you seeing in the Donbass region? They're just lobbing missiles. There's no attempt to do, at least doesn't appear to be an attempt, to do an efficient combined arms approach. So it is all of the things you're talking about are what's going to make an army effective. It is not just the weaponry. It's not just the information dominance. It's not just the speed of decision. It is all of these things, along with the morale of the troops, the professionalism of the soldiers, the flexibility of the units to make the tactical decision. All of that has to come into play to be good. The last question, sir, and I'm, I'm not sure if you are ready to speculate on that. And my question will be kind of a speculative question. You know, the clouds are gathering uh, over Eurasia. We have the Western Pacific tensions. We have war in Ukraine. So what do you think are the prospects for the next few years in terms of war? And, uh, you know, United States involvement, uh, all along the lines of those tensions. So are you also on the pessimist side that there might be war in the Western Pacific? That's just a very... No, I, I'm not. Actually, I, I've, uh, I do not think there will be war in the Western Pacific. Uh, I do not think China is going to invade Taiwan anytime soon. I think she has too many domestic problems to worry about invading Taiwan right now. I was very happy to see uh, the United States Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, meeting with President Xi this week. Um, we have got to have a dialogue. We, the West, we, the United States, have got to have a dialogue with China. Uh, the fact of the matter is the world needs China. The world needs China's human capital. They need China's uh, industrial base. The world needs China. We need to hold China accountable for the Uyghurs. We need to hold China accountable for Hong Kong. We need to hold China accountable when they violate the World Trade Organization. We need to hold China accountable for all the bad things they do. But at the same time, you've got to have a dialogue with them so we don't end up going to war. The Chinese don't want to go to war with us. We don't want to go to war with the Chinese. Um, and the best way to do that is to continue to have a dialogue. That dialogue has not been there for probably the last year. So I'm glad to see that the U.S. is reaching out. And you know, countries that are sophisticated, they can hold people accountable and still find common ground in order to make sure that there's a balance between diplomacy and deterrence and other things. Okay. That's a fair answer. And I appreciate it, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my guest today was uh, Admiral Retired Bill McRaven. Thank you, sir, again for being on my in my uh, talk. Thank you very it's much. Been, it's been great to be with you, and I wish uh, you and all the Polish uh, people the very, very best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.